Hare Krishna. So today is the last part of this discussion on facing adversities. And today I'll speak on the topic of even if we can't understand Krishna, we can stand under Krishna. So even if we can't understand Krishna, we can stand under Krishna. That means even if we can't always understand why something is happening, what is God's plan over here, still we can stand under him. Now when you stand under has two meanings. One is submission and the other is protection. When we stand under someone, that means we put ourselves below them, we are ready to obey them. But also when we stand under someone, say that person is holding an umbrella or there's a big bird, there's a mother bird and there's a baby bird. The baby bird stands under the extended wings of the mother bird. Then the baby bird is protected. So even if we can't understand what is happening, why it is happening in our lives, still we can stand under Krishna. That means we can submit to him and we can live within his protection. So I'll, like the previous two classes, I will talk three points. But before that, I will just quickly go over what I spoke earlier in the last two sessions. In the day before yesterday's class, the theme, main theme I was speaking was that when difficulties come in our life, at that time we have to see that this is just a, this is a bad phase in our life. Don't hyperventilate, don't get, uh, don't become too disheartened. And yes, so the main focus in the first session was that, yes, time sometimes becomes unfavorable for us. And when time becomes unfavorable, don't become unfavorable to the Lord. The second, yesterday what we discussed was, yes, is karma the cause of our suffering? It may or it may not be, but we are not meant to blame ourselves or blame others. We are meant to have a positive attitude and move on. So karma is not meant for condemnation, but it's for compassion. And so today, okay, we will go to the last part. Okay, now we are facing a problem. How do we move forwards? So three points I'll speak today is that, God, first point is God is the cause of all causes, but not the cause of all effects. The second point will be that, God's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds. Sometimes we make a mistake and we feel my life is over now. But God's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds. And the last point will be that when we face incomprehensible difficulties, we can change our driving question from why this to how now. We change our question from why this to how now. Let's go over these points one by one. First is that God is the cause of all causes, not the cause of all effects. What this means is sometimes some people say that everything that happens is, is God's plan. Okay, at one level it might sound very good. Oh, you have so much faith in God. You have faith that everything that happens is God's plan. But people commit mistakes. Is that God's plan? If somebody starts becoming an alcoholic, was it God's plan that they become an alcoholic? If somebody misuses their free will and does terrible things, is that God's plan? It's, it is an oversimplification of a very complex reality. So, Prabhupada in the next verse, he will say that everything is within Krishna's plan. It is not that everything is Krishna's plan. That means it is within his purview. So, let me explain this. That first, a metaphor to understand this point that God is the cause of all causes, but not the cause of all effects. Say when vegetation grows on the earth, now, if there were no rains, there would be nothing, nothing growing on the earth. So we could say rains are the cause of, of all the vegetation that grows on the earth. So in that sense, that's, it's true. But which vegetation grows where? 
that is not determined by the rates that is determined by what has been sown over there if somebody has carefully sown seeds for grains or seeds for flowers or fruits in orchard then that will be something flourishing that will grow over there if nothing has been sown maybe weeds will grow over there so what grows where is not determined by the rains although without rains nothing will grow anywhere similarly god's grace or god's uh, god, god without god nothing would exist without god no one would be able to do anything at the same time it is not god who does what we are doing what you i or anyone else does it is not god who is doing that always it is though that person using their free will they will do that so that's why upadrashta anumanta cha in 13.23 in the bhagavata krishna says that i am the overseer and the permitter krishna is not saying i am the doer of everything what we do it is we who do it it is not krishna doing it always through us so it is we have our free will and now it is krishna who gives us the ability it is the krishna who gives us the facility say if somebody becomes angry and they are about to punch an innocent person and they are they are very well built their fist can crack the throat of the victim now that ability ultimately comes from krishna at the same time if there some other security person is there or some some chivalrous person is there that person comes and stop don't beat or i'll beat you now one person is doing wrong the other person is doing right for both of them the ability has come from krishna the ability to act in that particular way has come from krishna the facility in the sense of the strength that they have the particular situation that they are in without krishna's plan that would not happen but one person might beat an innocent person another might protect an innocent person now who does what is not determined by krishna so krishna is the cause of all causes not the cause of all effects effects means what happens in the world so who does what is determined by each living being according to their free will and if some people misuse their free will then they can do terrible things so one of the questions that often atheists used to say that there's no god is that they say that how could god allow something like a holocaust to happen so th- millions of people were killed well and god did nothing what kind of god would allow that uh, what, how could god exist so here we have to understand that bhutanam yan mitha kali kunti maharani says that when conflicts happen in this world they are because of interpersonal interactions so by past karma all of us have given different spheres of control so some people when they speak they have such power that they can invigorate or incite a thousand people and some people when they speak they stammer and they can't even enunciate a few words properly and practically nobody is influenced by that so now this we could say is one example of the sphere of influence now why does one person have such extraordinary speaking ability and another has it's not even mediocre a uh, very meager speaking ability that we understand is by past karma so now by our past karma the sphere of influence around us is determined it is not just by our past karma it's our past karma and present karma also we if some even if somebody has good speaking skills they have to develop those speaking skills so that they can actually speak effectively but the point is by past karma somebody might have a large sphere of influence and by past karma somebody might have a small sphere of influence now that sphere of influence is what they will have for a finite time it might be for uh, say for hitler it was for 15 20 15 17 years for somebody it might be 2 years for somebody it might be for just a few months some people are nowadays in the digital world some people are like they are like comets their sensations for a few weeks 
and afterward they just sink and nobody hears about it. So what is happening over here is that by their past karma, they have a certain sphere of influence. Now within that sphere of influence, what they do is up to them. Somebody can use their phenomenal speaking ability to inspire others to do good things. And somebody can use their phenomenal speaking ability to incite others to do hate crimes, to do genocides. Now, the people who are within that sphere of influence of those people, when this person speaks badly, then when they, they get victimized by that, now that God is not doing it. You could say, yes, God is allowing it. That's true. But why is he allowing it? Because at one level, this person had the karma by which they were meant to be have that meant to have that power. So if person A falls, person A has a sphere of influence and person B happens to be in that sphere of influence. Then if A abuses the power which they have from past karma, then B may suffer. And when B suffers, it is not, it is not God causing that suffering. It is A causing that suffering. So when a particular person does bad things and certain people suffer because of that, then we have to understand that God is not the cause of all effects. God is not causing that suffering. Of course, a devotee can see everything spiritually and can see a spiritual opportunity even in suffering. Now, we could say that this person who is suffering, they must also be having some bad karma by cause of which they are victimized. That may be so, but in general, we are meant to deal with people from a this life perspective. And from this life's perspective, those who were victimized say, during the Holocaust or during the Soviet atrocities or so many other places, they were victims and such atrocities should not have happened. So, but the point is God is not responsible for this. If we misuse our free will and we misuse the sphere of influence that has been given to us and then some bad things happen within that, then that is not God's doing. So similarly for the Pandavas, they just happen to be in the sphere of influence of Duryodhan. And Duryodhan used all his evil genius to try to conspire against them and to try to destroy them. This was not God's doing. Although, as I'll talk in the next point, God can be doing something even through these doings. But it is not God directly doing these things. It is people use their free will or misuse their free will. And when they do certain things, accordingly the effects that come, they are coming from those people. They are not coming from God. So this is the first point. That when we have bad things happening in our life, we should never think that God is causing those bad things. Now what exactly is the cause? We don't know. We can't, we'll talk about that a little later. But it's not that God is the cause of all the things. God is not the cause of our suffering. God is ultimately the cure for our suffering. So any comments or questions about this? Yes, please. Maybe yeah. I'll repeat this. So you mentioned that if I uh, cause this harm to be, um, that, that suffering that B is experiencing is not God, it's caused by A. It can't be say that uh, the suffering that B is experiencing is due to the past karma and A is simply an instrument? Is that the proper way to understand? Okay, yes. So, can we say that if B is suffering, then B is suffering because of their own karma and A is simply an instrument? Yes, we could look at it that way in one perspective. That is, that the B shouldn't become vengeful about A. Oh, you did this to me and I'll get back to you. So in that sense, we can say that A is the instrument of B's karma and B shouldn't become vengeful. But at the same time, has anyone authorized A to be the instrument of B's karma? Is A even thinking of that, that B did some bad karma because of I am doing this? A may simply be thinking, I have my own selfish interests. And this person is coming in my way, I will I will get this person out of the way. So it's because A is not authorized to do, uh, to, uh, to take the law in their own hands. That's why A will also get karma for that. 
and so it's like if a person is a, is a horrendous serial killer and then the government decides to give capital punishment to them. The government is authorized to do that. But if somebody decides to do vigilante justice and that person decides to take the law in their hands and kill someone, then that person also becomes culpable. So now in this particular interaction, it is, is primarily to avoid a vengeful attitude that we should think ultimately A, a is simply an instrument of my karma. Let me not hit back at A. But at the same time, if A is doing something wrong, if A is abusing B, that doesn't mean that B has to passively take the abuse. And A should be allowed to go on doing the abuse. A is doing wrong and A needs to be corrected. And for B, B has to think what is the best way ahead for me. Should I just move away from here? Should I not, not seek revenge but seek justice? So the idea that others who are giving us suffering are simply the instruments of our karma is simply meant to prevent a rajasic or a tamasic response. A rajasic is that we fight back and it's fight, fight response. Tamasic, the mode of ignorance is flight response. We just feel sorry for ourselves, we take embrace a victimhood narrative and we make life worse for ourselves. But in sattva, we'll think thoughtfully and decide. Should I, okay, this is not such a big problem. I can tolerate it and move on with my life. If I can't, let me move aside and let me do something else and keep a distance so that this person doesn't hurt me. Or I can counter it. So I have a whole, whole seminar on this, you know, how to deal with it. I call it a three-point formula. Tolerate, mitigate or immigrate. You can do any of the three things. That, okay, this is not a big problem. It's a small thing. I can, I can live with it. Let me tolerate it. It's not pleasant, but I can live with it. So tolerate it. This is unbearable. I have to do something about it. We mitigate, not in the mood of taking revenge, but just in the mood of establishing order or establishing justice. This person does this to me, they will do this to somebody else, they will do this to somebody else. It will just keep perpetuating. So mitigate. Or I may feel that this is too big, a, this, is, this is too messy a problem and dealing with it will be too complicated for me. So I just walk away from here. We immigrate. I have better things to do in my life than trying to fight with this person. And, but I don't want to be hurt by this person also. So I walk away from it. So all three options are there. The idea that people are instruments of our karma is simply meant to ensure that we don't become vindictive and get caught in, uh, in uh, endless vendetta battles. Okay. okay. So that is the first point. That God is the cause of all causes but not the cause of all effects. The second point is that Krishna's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's misdeeds or mistakes. So mistakes are accidental. They didn't want to do it, but they did it. Say somebody is walking along a road and somebody has spilled water over there and somebody else slips and falls on that water and they fracture and they fall down badly and they get a fracture. Now it was, them, it was this person's mistake. The person had no malicious intention to cause somebody to fall. So now this person's whole life may get disrupted. Several weeks they might be on bed and not be able to do anything because of the fracture. So it's a mistake. A misdeed would be if somebody is going along a particular place and somebody plants a mine over there. As soon as they step on it, it explodes. So that's a misdeed. So now if people commit, if anyone, it, is, it can be others who commit mistakes or misdeeds, or it is we who commit mistakes or misdeeds. Now usually such mistakes or misdeeds will foil our plan. Say if we had to go for an important interview and we had to take some documents with us and we forgot to take it. And then the interviewer say, what kind of irresponsible person are you? And we fare, don't fare well in that interview because we forgot those things. Now that's a mistake. So mistakes can, can frustrate our plans. But no matter if, if and misde mis mistakes and misdeeds, misdeeds is more malicious or intentional, mistakes are unintentional. But either way, the point is that our plans can easily get frustrated by these. But Krishna's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds. And in that sense, we should never we, we needn't ever think that no, this is such a terrible mistake, such a, such a terrible misdeed. 
that now my life is over. Now nothing will work in my life. So Krishna's plan is infinitely resilient. Now resilient means that somebody falls down, they get up again. Resilience is considered a very good virtue in people. Because life will knock all of us down. If you can get up again and move on, then that kind of resilience is very helpful. Krishna's plan is infinitely resilient. That means sometimes we may do certain things which may, which may create a lot of trouble for us. And our mistakes or misdeeds, we can't say it's Krishna's plan. We, we can't say that when we do something wrong, it is Krishna who wanted us to do something wrong. No, it is we who did something wrong. But rather than thinking of Krishna's plan like one path, and if I one, it's one path, if I don't go off this path, if I don't go on this path, then I'm off Krishna's plan. Rather, we can see Krishna's plan is like a whole map. And even if I go off this path, within that also there is a pathway by which I can come back. So Krishna's plan is infinitely resilient. And that's why we don't have to lose hope that Krishna's plan will be, it can't be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds. It is infinitely resilient. So let's understand this by a couple of examples. So now, in the Mahabharata, later on it is described that just before the Kurukshetra war, Vidura was uh, trying again and again to, pers to pursue Duryodhan and Dhritarashtra. But at one particular point, Duryodhan had become so brazen that he grievously insulted Vidur. And Vidur was his elder, like his father, father, his uncle. And he grievously insulted him and told him, get out of here. Get out with nothing except your breath. And this was very insulting words and Vidur felt hurt by it. Terribly hurt. At the same time, Vidur saw in this a plan. An opportunity. An opportunity to just get out of the war that was going to happen. So he took that opportunity and he went into the forest. And he increased his spirituality by associating with the sages, by doing austerities. And thereby he grew. And thereby he grew in his spirituality. When he came back again, the war was over. The Trashtra had become who, who were very attached. He was still attached, but his attachment had been permanently frustrated now. Then Vidur, with his increased spiritual potency from his austerities, when he spoke again, he was able to persuade with the Dhrashtra to give up his attachment and to become enlightened. So, to gain enlightenment. So, basically the point here is, when Duryodhan, uh, Duryodhan spoke so, so insulted Vidur so grievously, Duryodhan speaking those words, Duryodhan was not thinking, I am doing Krishna's plan. Krishna himself had come to try to avoid the Kurukshetra war. Vidura was also trying the same thing. But Krishna's plan was resilient. Okay, if Duryodhana is not ready to act like this, then still Krishna's plan is to establish Dharma. One way could be that if Duryodhana also gives up his adharmic ways, then Dharma can be established. But if Duryodhana is not ready to give up his adharmic ways, then Duryodhana will be, will be eliminated and Krishna will establish Dharma. So Krishna's plan is resilient. Vidur was trying to do Krishna's plan by getting Duryodhan to follow the path of Dharma. When Duryodhan did not do that, then Vidur continued his own service to Krishna. So, often we keep blaming ourselves or we keep blaming others. And neither of those can actually help us move forward in doing constructive things. So, yes. People can do terrible things, even we can do terrible things. But we need to look up towards Krishna. Not just look at ourselves or look at others. To be Krishna conscious means to not let our consciousness be caught in how bad people are or even how bad we are. Yes, we want to be aware that we may be capable of doing terrible things, which we would normally think I would never do. And it may be that others are also capable of doing uh, terrible things. But in spite of that potential for wrongdoing which we may have, still Krishna's plan is operational. So when we focus 
not on how bad people are or how are or how bad we are but how good krishna is how powerful krishna is then in spite of those circumstantial situations we will we will find some transcendental direction that this is an important point there is the circumstantial and there is the transcendental so the circumstantial can be the way, the way people are around us the kind of situations we are in in one sense our own psychology our own mind is also circumstantial because we are souls different from our mind so even if we have terrible conditionings which make us do wrong things again and again still that is also external to us we are not our bad habits we may have those bad habits right now we may have our weaknesses we are not that weakness so that is also circumstantial and when we look up at krishna what happens we understand that krishna's plan is still operational krishna's plan is not going to be blocked by what i am doing or what anyone is doing so then we don't lose hope see our circums as i said there is a circumstantial and there is a transcendental our circumstances are like a carpet the carpet is below us and we have to be aware of it if the carpet is filled with water we might slip on it if the carpet is full of holes our foot might get caught in it if the carpet is smooth we can walk nicely so what kind of carpet is there below we have to be aware of it but the carpet needs to be below us if the carpet goes above us then it will suffocate us it will blind us and it will suffocate us two things so similarly if we focus only on how bad we are or how bad people are or how bad our situation is then what are we doing we are letting the circumstances become like a carpet above us it then the circumstances will blind us and will suffocate us suffocate means we feel i can't even survive and blind means i can't see what should i do now so when we become conscious of krishna then we acknowledge the circumstances just like the carpet how it is i have to acknowledge it but i am above it in what sense not that i am superior but that i am spiritual i am a soul as a soul i am indestructible and in that sense if this the the whatever things are happening they happen to my body they happen to my mind but i as a soul am indestructible so by understanding that we are the indestructible consciousness we are the observer of our situations we are the observer of our emotions we can rise above our circumstances and not just by this intellectual understanding that i am above but also that i am a part of one of someone who is above krishna is a supreme being and his plan is still operational if you just look horizontally we'll get overwhelmed if when things start looking down we need to start looking up if we also start looking down we'll become disheartened when things start looking down means people around us become gloomy people they make mistakes or we make mistakes or just the economy goes down the things go down when things start going down we need to start looking up of course we could say we need to always keep looking up but especially when start things start looking down we need to start looking up when we do that then we will have hope we'll have positivity and gradually we'll find a direction so krishna's plan is never baffled or blocked by no matter what mistakes we do in an earlier class i gave the example of google maps of gps gps tells us take a right turn and if you take a left turn and what does google gps do does gps say you didn't obey me get lost no gps doesn't say that gps reroutes and shows us the way so the gps has got the whole territory mapped so krishna's plan is like the gps and therefore even if we have committed a mistake say we might take a wrong turn or we might ask someone should i take a left or right and they mislead us so we have gone wrong but krishna's plan is still operational understanding this can give us hope so this is the second point that krishna's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds any comments or questions
okay so i'll go to the last point now so the first point i said is that actually <coughs> whatever happens is not necessarily krishna's plan krishna is the cause of all causes not the cause of all effects but even if bad things are happening krishna's plan is still operational krishna's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds but then the big question comes okay what am i meant to do okay this terrible thing has happened and what am i meant to do this is where the third point is that uh, when we face incomprehensible adversities we change our question from why this to how now why did this happen why did this person do like this why did this why did i do like that why this that question naturally comes up and that question can if we just just let that question go on in our mind sometimes the why question we can get an answer sometimes as a practical answer is helpful okay now why was i inattentive so if somebody slips and falls and they get a fracture now why was i so inattentive no maybe i was worried about this maybe i was talking with that person maybe that person called me whatever so there might be circumstantial reason and we can learn in the future i can be attentive more attentive but sometimes the why question just gives no answers now we can use our intelligence as far as it goes to try to find an answer to the why question why did this happen but sometimes you know we don't have to sometimes this why question we might come up with speculative ideas that may not be very healthy say one devotee was once going for an important interview job interview and that morning he was very worried about it so he was doing his rounds but he didn't chat attentively and then he was going for his interview and suddenly his car broke down and he actually couldn't reach for the interview in time and everything went uh, flop so then he concluded that okay because i did not chant krishna's names attentively today that's why krishna broke my car down now is that really so i don't know i mean how can you how, how can you know krishna's mind how can we really say that it's now where in scripture says krishna is a vindictive god or oh, you don't chant my name attentively i'll create trouble in your life it's not like that there could be a hundred other causes of that so when we try to find a an answer to the why question if the answer is favorable if we might come up with some answer and if that answer is favorable for our devotion that is good so somebody might if somebody thinks like this is that wrong well wrong and right here there is no authority to decide this if somebody says the time right now is 9:20 it is objective truth i can say it's not 9:20 but if somebody says my car broke down because i did not chant attentively well how do you know can you ask krishna to find out whether this is right or wrong so we have to look at in such situations what what is the effect of it on us if that makes me think okay in future even if i have big things to do let me focus on my chanting and when those things come i will do those things so if that inspires us to chant attentively maybe that effect is good and we can think like that but if instead if that makes me feel angry with krishna feel resentful of krishna feel feel scared of krishna and that creates a whole negative attitude towards krishna in me there are different kinds of phobias uh, you know there are there is a phobia called theophobia theophobia is fear of god now this is not a very healthy kind of thing there is there is a healthy fear of god where we don't want to displease god or disobey god but theophobia is where if the person is paranoid that god is out to get me now it's a horrible feeling to have god is not our enemy out to get us krishna's purpose is not to catch us when we do wrong krishna's purpose is to catch us when we fall catch us when we do wrong eh you did that wrong now take this punishment krishna is not like a fault finding god who delights in catching us doing fault krishna's purpose is not to catch us when we do wrong krishna's purpose is to catch us when we fall and like a mother is helping a child walk and the child falls the mother doesn't hey you fell down the mother starts clapping 
I'll laugh at you now. You fell down. But Krishna is not like that. Krishna's purpose is to catch us when we fall. He's there with us. We are walking and we fall. The mother is there to catch us. So Krishna is not a critic. Krishna is not so much a judge as a coach. So the point which I am making here is that sometimes we may come up with our own answers of the why question. Why did this happen? And if that answer increases our Krishna consciousness in a positive way, that is good. Otherwise, there is no need to speculate too much about it. What can we do instead? Okay, I don't know why this has happened. Let me simply focus on how. How means, as I said, instead of asking why this, ask the question, how now? How now means, how can I serve you now, Krishna? Okay, this was my plan. This is how I wanted to serve you. But now this has happened. This has happened. And this plan doesn't work. So how can I serve you now? Now both these questions, the both the two words over here, both of them are very important. How is, if we are not asking why, how is a practical question. Okay, what can I do? And now is important. Well, why now is important? Because sometimes when suddenly things go wrong in our life, we just can't have a long-term picture. We might have a long-term plan. Okay, I'm going to have this uh, job and I'm going to grow in this career and I'm going to do this and I want to do that. And suddenly we are fired. Then what do I do? At that time, if I think of a 10-year plan, 10-year plan, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next 10 days. I don't have enough money for the next one month. What After one month, I don't have money. So how now? Now means that we decrease the time frame of action. And when difficulties come in our life, when difficulties start becoming too big, instead of thinking in too big terms, just decrease the time, time frame for, for action. Okay, what can I do in the next one hour? How can I act in the next one day? So how can I serve Krishna now? Now means just decrease the frame of reference. When difficulties come up, Sometimes what happens is our mind makes the difficulties worse. Now today's problems, no matter how big, can be dealt with today. But when today's problems are piled with yesterday's problems and tomorrow's problems, then it becomes unbearable. So then, yes, there might be a big problem tomorrow and when it comes, I deal with it. Let me focus on today. Let, how can I serve Krishna in the next one hour? How can I serve Krishna in this one day? Okay, maybe I can, I can just chant Hare Krishna, maybe I can pray to Krishna, maybe I can read something, hear something, calm myself down. And after I am calmed down, then I can think of how to move forward. So at that time, just take one step forward, one step forward, one step forward, one step forward. When we do that, at that time, that service attitude, service attitude is, how can I serve you now? How can I serve you now? So when, like yesterday I mentioned this point that some, when, when we are going through a dark phase, that dark phase is like a tunnel, not a dungeon. Now, still it's dark, isn't it? If we are going through a, in the daytime on a brightly lit path, then we can easily see, if it's a, even if it's a tunnel, it's dark. So when we are suddenly, we suddenly find ourselves in a tunnel, at that time, we can't create the sun. But we can have a flashlight. That flashlight is our service attitude. The flashlight cannot, may not show us even what is, 10, what is 100 feet away. But the flashlight will at least show us what is 1 feet away. Ahead. And I take that one step forward with that flashlight. And what will happen? The flashlight will show me the next step ahead. And the next step ahead. And the next step ahead. So the service attitude, how now? Krishna, how can I serve you now? That will help us to move forward. So when the sunlight goes out of our life, we can turn on the flashlight. When the sunlight is like the sunlight is like our plan for life. Our, we might have a master plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. When the sunlight goes out of our life, we can turn on our flashlight. That is our service attitude. How now? Krishna, how can I serve you now? I have faith that your plan is still operating. But I don't know what is your plan. How can I serve you now? And one step forward, one step forward, one step forward. 
and gradually the sunlight will come back. The tunnel, we will come out of the tunnel. So here for Yudhishthir, it is being, uh, Bhishma is indirectly telling him, why this happened? Why this catastrophe with so many people dying in the war happened? Now, we can't know. But you do your part right now. And what is your part? Have service attitude. The Lord's plan for you right now is continue. If the Lord wants you to become the king. The Lord wants you to become the ruler and establish dharma. Do that. So just decrease the frame of reference right now. But if this is what the Lord wants you to do. Do it. So similarly for us. If we decrease the frame of reference, instead of asking the big question, why did this happen? What am I to do with my life? We focus, especially when we are going through difficulties. There are times when we need to ask that big question also. What do I want to do in my life? When we are in Sattva Guna, when we are peaceful, when things are orderly in our life, at least when we are, our mind is orderly, uh, then we can ask that big question and make a big plan. But when things become disorderly, when we are disoriented, just we decrease the frame of reference for action. And how now? And with that flashlight, we can move on. Shila Prabhupada just did that. When he came to America, he said that, I didn't know whether to turn left or right. Prabhupada just kept moving forward. Wherever opportunities came, anybody invited him to speak, he went there. Wherever he got an opportunity, he kept moving there. And eventually, such wonderful opportunities came that the whole world eventually became Krishna conscious. So for all of us, this can be our broad attitude. Krishna, how can I serve you now? And even through the darkest of phases, that service attitude will serve as a flashlight, which will eventually take us back to the sunlight. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of, even if we can't understand Krishna, we can still stand under Krishna. We can still be, with the, we can be submissive to Krishna, and we can be within the protection of Krishna. So I talked three points. The first point was, uh, God is the cause of all causes, not the cause of all effects. When we make, uh, when bad things happen in our life, it is not that God is out there to catch us and punish us. God is not necessarily making those bad things happen to us. It's like what grows on the surface of the earth is not determined by the rains. The rains determine that something will grow, but what specifically grows depends on the, what is sown over there. Similarly, without Krishna's sanction, nothing will happen. But by Krishna's sanction, based on people's past karma, he has given them free will and he has given them a kshetra, an area for exercising their free will. And if somebody has a big area for exercising their free will, and we happen to be in that area, and there they misuse their free will, then if we get abused, if we get exploited, it is not God doing it. It is they doing it. And they will get the karma for that. So it's, we, we, should, we should never get a negative attitude towards God, thinking that God is the cause of my suffering. And second point is that, yes, when bad things happen, Krishna's plan is too big to be blocked by anyone's mistakes or misdeeds. Mistakes are accidental, misdeeds are intentional. But either way, Krishna's plan still remains operational. And rather than thinking of Krishna's plan as just one path, we can see it as a broad map in which various paths are interconnected. So Krishna is like the GPS. Even if we are misled or we take a wrong turn, still the GPS can always reroute and show us the path back. So Krishna's plan is infinitely resilient. And that's why we needn't lose hope because of any mis many mistakes that we have done. For us, people's mistakes or misdeeds or our own mistakes or misdeeds, they are circumstantial. We are the soul who is transcendental. And our circumstances are meant to be like a carpet, which is to be kept below us. We are, have to be aware, just like we are aware of the carpet we are walking on, but we don't have to let be, be aware only of that. If you become obsessed with the circumstantial, and like, that's like the carpet coming over our head and that will suffocate and blind us. So by being conscious of Krishna and his mercy, not on how bad we are or how bad people are, we can rise above our circumstances. And the last point was, 
that amidst, amidst inconceivable atros, uh, adversities, we change our driving question from why this to how now. Our plan for big plan for life is like a sunlight. Sometimes the sunlight goes out of our life. But instead of just wallowing in the darkness, we can turn on the flashlight of our service attitude. Krishna, how can I serve you now? So how indicates that mood of submission. Krishna, I, I know your plan is still there and I want to serve you. And now signifies decreasing the frame of reference. That sometimes things are so bad that if you start thinking about tomorrow, day after, one week, one month, you will get overwhelmed. So let's deal with today's problems today and tomorrow's problems tomorrow. So decrease the frame of reference and just the flashlight can show us one step ahead. And that is enough for now. And the next step will be shown. And the next step will be shown. And in that way, we can march ahead steadily. And ultimately, even if we are in a very dark place, the flashlight of service attitude will get us out of the dark place with the sunlight of Krishna's grace and Krishna's plan once again. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Is there any question or comment? One question? Yes, please. Okay. okay. How do we know whether we are working in harmony with Krishna's plan or are resisting it? Again, it's rather thinking of Krishna's plan as one path. We can think of it like a network of paths. And it's Krishna doesn't want us to be like a puppet with absolutely no free will. We have free will and Krishna wants us to use our free will in a, in a loving expression of service for him. So that means that <clears throat> we don't have to have this digital attitude towards Krishna's plan. That either I am following Krishna's plan or I am defying Krishna's plan. It's not necessarily one zero. Yes, yeah, sometimes can be, we can be, it can be that we are defying. But Krishna's plan can be much more inclusive. We can be at different degrees of harmony with Krishna's plan also. So broadly, if we are in the right direction, we are going towards Krishna, then that's good enough. That's the first thing. Now, within that, generally speaking, uh, it's a, if we have a spiritual guide, we ask them and if they are close enough to us to understand us, if they are very spiritually advanced, then they can provide us guidance. And if, if, our, if our spiritual master tells us something, we can broadly see that that is Krishna's plan. At a practical level, however, for most devotees, the spiritual master may not be that accessible. And the spiritual master may also not take the position that what I am saying is, saying is Krishna's plan. Spiritual master may also say that this is a suggestion, see if it works out. So what we have to do, we have to see that Krishna, our relationship with Krishna is like an ongoing dynamic uh, reciprocation. So with our intelligence, with our best intelligence, with our prayer, with guidance from others, we decide what is the best course of action for us. And we take the blessings of senior devotees and do that. And we may decide, we don't have to necessarily, especially unless, we don't have to necessarily irrevocably commit to say a particular, particular service or a particular course of action. We can decide, okay, this is what, if say we want to discover what is my service, what is the service that I can best do for Krishna. Then we may decide, okay, for the next one month, the next three months, next six months, I will try this out. I'll do this as well as I can and then I'll see how it works. So if broadly speaking, what should happen if we are, it says Bhagavad Gita says that susukham kartumave, bhakti is joyfully performed. So if we are broadly in harmony with Krishna's plan, our Krishna consciousness will blossom. It's not that we will always be dancing in ecstasy. But at a deeper level, there will be a sense of fulfillment. Yes, I am I'm developing a connection with Krishna. I am making a contribution to Krishna. 
so it's good to with our intelligence just with our uh, decide a particular plan and stick to that plan for a finite amount of time no need to keep second guessing ourselves all the time am i doing the right thing am i doing the wrong thing if we commit to a particular course just do it in a committed way for a finite amount of time and then we can take stock and then see whether this was the best thing to do or maybe i need to be doing something else so shri prabhupad was like that shri prabhupad tried different things for for sharing krishna consciousness initially he thought i will earn money and contribute to my spiritual master's mission he is a great preacher he will preach what can i preach but then he couldn't he was not very successful in business then he started a magazine when that didn't work out uh, because people were just not interested in magazines then he thought let me write books he was able to the great struggle before that actually he thought let me work with my god brothers let me start an institute he started league of devotees so sometimes we try something and it doesn't work then when that was not working for a while okay let me leave let me not do this anymore let me try something else so broadly speaking the mahabharat says which this is a whole subject but i'll not take too much time broadly speaking the mahabharat says that we can understand what we should do and what we should not do by three factors intent content and consequence intent means why am i doing something so if our intention is good so actually i did this only because i wanted to help i wanted to serve i wanted to contribute so intention is important and then what we are doing is also important content is also important so suppose if i can't sing at all and i think i by main service will be doing kirtans well, that's that's not compatible with your nature you can't do it so we have to think in terms of content what is workable for me what is not workable for me so uh, intent is why am i doing it content is how well i can do it broadly and then consequences what is the result of it uh, ultimately we want two results one is connection the other is contribution the result should increase whatever service we do that service should increase our connection with krishna and that service should lead to a contribution we should be able to do something tangible krishna service maybe connect more people with krishna get more resources for krishna so if that is not happening then if the consequence is not coming it's not that we are attached to the results for our own sake but we want to offer the results to krishna so if something is not working we need to be flexible that's why i'll conclude with that i said that instead of thinking of krishna's plan as like one path you can see it as a network of paths and it's just like if if we take a i say if i am going to drive from here to gold coast and say there are three routes available one says 55 minutes another says 45 minutes another says 1 hour i might choose the 45 minute one but suppose some traffic issue comes over there and it suddenly changes to 1 hour 30 minutes then i might change over to the one which is saying 55 minutes so our purpose is to go towards gold, gold coast we are fixed in purpose but we are flexible in the path so similarly for us we are fixed we should be fixed in the purpose of serving krishna but what is krishna's plan for me no krishna has not come before me to tell me so let me use my best intelligence which comes through cultivating sattva guna through cultivating prayer and a connection with krishna so taking guidance from senior devotees and do my best and prabhupad had it all but still prabhupad's intention was simply to glorify spiritual master prabhupad was doing devotional activities he was distributing writing articles he was trying to uh, do preaching set up an organization it was not working then he changed track so it's like there are it's like multiple routes are routes are there if this route doesn't work try that route is that that route so in that sense to stay fixed in krishna's plan we need to be flexible about our plan that okay this this is what with my best understanding i did if it didn't work let me try this now so we are fixed in the purpose of serving krishna but we were flexible in the how we go about serving krishna now flexible doesn't mean that we just uh, keep changing continuously it's not that one week i do this and i don't like this we shift to another thing i think no we can have some substantial commitment to do a particular course of action because everything that we do nothing in this world is really easy even if there's something which we like to do there'll be times when we won't like it 
I'll, one of my main services is writing. I love to write. But there are times when writing seems so painful. Just don't feel like it. So we can't let it dependent simply on our mind's moods. The moods will keep changing. But on a long term basis, a significant commitment we make and then test it out. And if we have a prayerful mood, if we are trying to, okay, I'll conclude with this point. See, there are certain things which we know are what Krishna wants us to. Krishna wants us to chant Hare Krishna. Krishna wants us to study the scriptures. Krishna wants us to worship Him. There are certain things which we know Krishna wants us to do. So if we do them wholeheartedly, we are showing Krishna, I want to serve you. And then in the remaining area of our life, Krishna will guide us. If those things also we don't do properly, there, there is no doubt Krishna wants us to do these things. So if we do those, th if where, how to serve Krishna is clear. If we are doing that well, then Krishna will make it clear how to serve him where it is unclear also. But if we become so confused and disheartened that where it is clear what to do, we don't do that also. Then essentially we are showing Krishna that I am not interested in serving you. That may not be what our consciousness is, but that's what we are doing by our actions. So instead of worrying too much whether I am doing Krishna's plan or not, we focus on doing our direct devotional activities as well as we can and then do the remaining with the best intelligence and Krishna will guide us. Okay. So thank you very much. Antraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Shula Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, by Gaur Premanande. So this is my last class here today. Thank you all for your association. It was very uplifting to see how wonderfully this whole community is growing and creating space for Western devotees also to come to Krishna at their pace. So if I have committed any offences, please forgive me for that. And please accept my humble obeisances. Vancha kalpataru vyascha kripa sindhu bhyai vachan patitanam pavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namo namaha antakoti vaishnavrindaki